Good morning, good afternoon. Today we are from Rotterdam speaking and I have the honor to be the moderator of this panel. Uh, I am Duna Olive. I am the commercial director of the Sustain Food Complex in Sierra. And I'm very happy because I have here three colleagues, three great speakers from the Port of Rotterdam who will talk about what they view um, are the developments that are happening internationally and in Rotterdam about green hydrogen. So they will share with us their work, the developments, their plans, their timelines, all that is happening here in Rotterdam in a nutshell, and also how the Port of Rotterdam looks at development internationally. And of course, why not also mention our the same uh, port complex and see how it all comes together. So, the first speaker is Mr. Randolph Wetterich. And Randolph is the program manager for electrification and hydrogen. He's a very busy man, so we're very happy to have him with us today. So, without further ado, Randolph, please uh, let us know what the plans are in Rotterdam with regards to hydrogen. Thank you very much, Duna, for this kind introduction. Um, Monica, can you please pull the slides? Um, see when it comes up. Thank you very much. Um, so indeed, my name is Randolph Weterings. I'm the Program Manager Electrification and Hydrogen within the Port of Rotterdam. And today I would like to uh, well, take you through the Port of Rotterdam for uh, our hydrogen plants, our hydrogen vision that we have and all the elements that we uh, develop in the port. Um, so let me first start with the port of Rotterdam itself. So please, next slide, uh, Monica. So today, the, the port of Rotterdam is still um, the largest port in Europe. We're not anymore uh, the biggest port in, in the world, but the largest, still the largest port in, in Europe. And almost 30 to 40% of the total European energy demand enters Europe via the port of Rotterdam. So on the left-hand side, you see all the activities that we do within the port. The different colors indicate the different activities uh, that we have. And what you see, roughly 50% of that is related to fossil fuels. Um, if we look to hydrogen, we expect that hydrogen will have a significant role to play in decarbonizing those industries. So within the port of Rotterdam, but also further on in the system, because only 95% of the energy, or 95% of the energy that comes into the port goes further into the system. So also further on uh, towards Germany, it's very important for us to, to focus on. If you can go to the next slide, Monica. Jenda, before you go to the next slide, maybe so people could see you, could you please change seats with louder? I think that could work oh, yeah, sure. uh, best. So people yep. can see you while you're presenting. <laughs> can okay, you go one slide back, Monica? And I think I missed then one slide because I also had a slide prepared um, related to the vision that we have. Um, so the Port of Rotterdam is um, what, we did, what we did in order to decarbonize those industries that you see in here is, um, is we did together with a with multiple companies within the Port of Rotterdam, but also further on in the system to see, okay, what kind of volumes can we expect related to hydrogen in order to decarbonize? So our vision is that towards 2050, we need at least 20 million tons of hydrogen that flow through the port of Rotterdam towards uh, the, the industry in, in Rotterdam, but also further on the system towards Germany. But we are not there today. Today we have roughly half a million tons of hydrogen produced and consumed in this area. We have uh, infrastructure connecting Rotterdam with Antwerp, and with the, the north part of France. Um, and this is based on steam reformers. So basically from natural gas, we produce hydrogen with steam reformers and the CO2 is going into the air. So the first steps that we have towards 2030 is to decarbonize those gray hydrogen production plants. So we have a, a Portos project, which is decarbonizing the existing industry. So we can capture the CO2 and we can store it under the North Sea. And it means that we turn the gray hydrogen into blue hydrogen. 
Um, towards 2030, we, we believe that, uh, that we also need an extra step in between, uh, and that is what we call the Age Vision Project. And I will go, uh, go into more details about that later on. Uh, the next element that we have is what we start is green hydrogen production. Uh, this is really, in the, in the end, uh, the, the major part. And um, we are starting the import facilities. So if you look to 2030 or to 2050, we expect that 90% of the hydrogen should be imported and 10% of that 20 million tons can be produced locally. And the simple reason for that is that in the Netherlands and, and also in other parts of Europe, we do not have enough space to produce it all by ourselves. So 10% of our vision means 20, 20 to 25 gigawatt of offshore wind capacity that we need to, to install in order to produce hydrogen. So this is what you also see on, on this picture in front of you. So what you see in front of you is the port of Rotterdam and basically the, uh, the hub position that we create within the port. So on the left-hand side, you see the different uh, producing activities. So towards 2015, 90% of the total vision should focus on import. With import, and Monica will tell you much more about it later on, we focus on liquid hydrogen, we focus on ammonia, and we focus on liquidogenic hydrogen carriers. Because of today, we don't know yet what kind of technology will, will be the winner of, them, of those all. Uh, the second option, what you see on the left-hand side, is uh, the CCS Portals project. It's connecting the existing steam reformers in, in this area, and also the Age Vision project, in, somewhere in the middle. And the Age Vision project is about decarbonizing the, um, the waste gases that we have within industry. So the dip, for example, the different refineries, they have waste gas, they then now turn into, into energy, so into uh, high, high temperature steam, but also it turn, turn that into uh, electricity production. And what we're going to do is to place a factory in between that decarbonizes the, uh, the waste gases, take the CO2 and store it under the North Sea and use the, green, uh, the blue hydrogen for, um, for the high temperature heat and, and electricity production. Then the third option that we have is the offshore wind. So we are really, and as, an, as, as the Netherlands, we're really increasing the offshore wind capacity. And towards 2030, we uh, reserve a two gigawatt offshore wind farm that we connect on the mass fluctor. Um, if you can go one back, um, with what we call a conversion park. So we connect it with large scale hydrogen production. And the conversion park is basically, it's, it's a central place on the mass fluctor where we, uh, where large scale electrolyzers can be pull, uh, put into, and from there they can scale up. So what we organize is the large scale infrastructure already there. So today, if you focus on electrolyzers, you will see that um, the existing technology has a range of 10 to 20 megawatt. And in this facility, we're going to scale that up to 200 megawatt. And different projects of 200 megawatts add up to at least one gigawatt. So this, this is the reason that we can combine those different projects and connect it with an offshore wind farm. So we will bring the large scale electricity infrastructure to there. And also we connect it, what you see in the middle, the white area, the white pipeline, which is the hydrogen backbone, the high transport.rtm project. So within, with this project, uh, that's basically the first step in, in creating the real hydrogen hub within the port of Rotterdam. It's a third pipeline that we create within the port of Rotterdam. So the first two are privately owned, and this one is a open access infrastructure. So what we, what we are creating with that is that the different sources of hydrogen, the different supplies of hydrogen can, um, can be matched with the demand side. So the first step is within the port of Rotterdam. So you will have industry, which what we currently see is an increase, having an increasing demand for hydrogen within the existing, infrastructure, uh, existing um, industry, but also for, um, for decarbonizing, for example, their feedstock. The second option that we see is also in heavy mobility. So we expect that also heavy mobility will increasingly use hydrogen instead of the fossil-based products. So we have two projects um, in this area. One is focusing on uh, inland navigation. It's called the Rhine project. And we also have a project, the Hytrax project, 
uh, which is focusing on uh, transportation via road, trucks. Um, within the mobility sector, we are also focusing, and well, it's, it's really in the beginning phase, on the seagoing vessels, which are more looking into hydrogen as well, and also in uh, the form of um, e-fuels, so synthetic kerosene, for example, for, for example, aviation. So those are the first developments that we see within the port of Rotterdam itself. And of course, we are also connected with the municipalities around us. So um, the greenhouses, but also homes. Um, if we can use hydrogen from there, we want to connect it with the, the grid that we have over here and make the, sure that the production um, suits the, uh, the, 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 the demand side. So this is phase one. And then the second phase of this project, of the, uh, the, the pipeline project, we're also focusing on connecting it with the Dutch natural uh, hydrogen grid. So together with um, uh, Gasuni, which is the Dutch TSO for hydrogen infrastructure, we're connecting it with their uh, natural grid. And we are developing a second pipeline, which is the Delta Corridor. And Wouter will tell you much more about it later on, uh, where we connect North Rhine-Westphalia and also Gemmelot to the system of, uh, of Rotterdam. Um, because my colleagues will tell you more about the, uh, the infrastructure and also the import side, uh, what I would like to do, to do now is to focus more on the electrolyzers. Um, because I think this is a really unique uh, opportunity that we create here in, in the port of Rotterdam. So what I already said in the beginning, um, our focus, the focus of technology providers today is scaling up the technology from 10, 20 megawatts towards 200 megawatts. And we are in this, in this um, conversion park actually making the next step already and go to a, a gigawatt scale factory. So what you see over here is uh, four plots. So four locations of four different um, uh, companies that build their electrolyzer. Uh, two are already in the public. So uh, one is the 200 megawatt electrolyzer of Shell. We have also a project in this with BP Nurion. It's called the H50 project. It's a 250 megawatt electrolyzer. Uh, this all wants to be operational, the complete conversion park before 2025. So the, uh, it's also very close by in, in time, I would say. Um, and the other two are not yet in the public, but they are already developing, uh, really developing also the, uh, the electrolyzers over there. So you will see that in total, this, this will end up to at least one gigawatt. Um, on the right hand side, you see an empty um, and then some empty places where, where we also uh, get the offshore wind, wind farm, farm connected to the, uh, to the port of Rotterdam, at least yeah, in that, that area. And on, on top of that, we also have some central facilities. Because what, what I already said, um, what we are going to do is combine those four and see that from an in, uh, infrastructure perspective as basically one, um, one factory. So we will create a two gigawatt electricity cable to it. So it will be connected with the Dutch natural, natural grid and also with the offshore wind farm. Um, we will connect it with central facilities to an open access pipeline for hydrogen. So the high, truck, high, high transport uh, project. And for the next phase, we are also capturing the, the oxygen and bring it to the industries and also extract the heat. So today, uh, roughly, uh, the efficiency of an electrolyzer is around 75%. That means that 25% will come out, of, uh, come out of the system as heat. And this is exactly what we are going to utilize as well. Uh, and this is also why we are really scaling up this technology. Because from a 200 megawatt perspective, 25% is not so much heat. But if you, go, if you look at it from a 1 gigawatt or maybe 2 gigawatt scale, it really becomes valuable. So that is exactly what we what we do in this uh, this area. Um, well, I think this is an, um, an, a very interesting development, and I really hope that from here you will see more one and two gigawatt scale factories coming, um, because this is just the beginning. Uh, this is already taking 24, 25 hectares of space in the port of Rotterdam. And this is the, just the first gigawatt. And for the own production, what I showed you in the, uh, in, in the vision is that we need 20 to 25, which is 10% of the total vision of those factories. Thank you very much. 
And now Thank going you, back Orlando. to you. Dawn. Thank you. Um, Monica, if you could uh, perhaps just put the slide back down. Um, I think it's quite impressive the, the, the plans that Randolph has, uh, has shown to us. And Randolph, maybe uh, it's very uh, common to you to see but the location of the electrolyzer part, but maybe it's good to tell where it is located at the Port of Rotterdam because not a lot of people know that where the mass flux is. So maybe you could just tell a little bit about uh, that area where it is located. Yeah. So Monica, can you maybe pull the slides again and then go to the second uh, <coughs> second slide? Um, so we are located in, uh, of course, in in the Netherlands in Rotterdam, and on the left hand side you see the mass fluctum, and on the basically very close to the sluster, so almost where the the pointer is right now, uh, on the purple uh, the purple area, so very close to the uh, to the to the North Sea itself, we will have the electrolyzer park. And the reason for that is that it is that it will be connected with offshore wind. And the offshore wind farm will be, um, uh, you know, there will be a cable from the offshore wind farm towards the electrolyzer. And yes, to, the, to that area. And from there, we connect it with offshore wind. So it, the what you currently see is that the offshore wind farms, and at least the the landfall of Osho wind is very close to the uh, to the side of the port of Rotterdam, where you know you enter from the North Sea towards the towards the shore side. Um, that is exactly also the uh, where we currently foresee the electrolyzers being built up. Right, and the reason that I uh, wanted to make an, a point out of the location is because you see on the right side of this picture where. Rotterdam as a city is, and how the port has developed more western, and that's really at the at the, at the newest uh, location, let's say, with Maslak the Tool being a reclamation um, project. So that's yep. quite interesting, also to see um, from a Brazilian perspective. This is is quite a, a remarkable port development. And the other question that I have to ask, Randolph, is so many parties. So many um, interests, so many different perspectives. When you talk about the electrolyzer park, what are the what is the role, in your view, of the Port of Rotterdam to make sure that this development actually does take place and does materialize? Yeah, that's a very good question, Duna. Um, so we we started in 2016 exploring the demand side for hydrogen. So how the expectation that we had for green hydrogen, how much green hydrogen do we need? And the second phase for us was to, with the infrastructure providers, to, to organize and to see, okay, what kind of, of infrastructure is needed in order to make sure that this development could take place. And one of the conclusions that we had, so we, we developed the, uh, the, the blueprints for, um, for the hydrogen production, but also for the complete electricity system in, in, in Rotterdam, or at least in the port of Rotterdam, um, we saw that we couldn't provide uh, the, uh, the amount of electricity needed via cables. And we knew, we saw in the vision, we saw in the discussions that we had with, with our clients that they were not only you need, they, they didn't only need the, the electricity, but they definitely need also green hydrogen. And what we saw was that if we are going, to, if we bring the electricity, the, the hydrogen production towards shore, so towards uh, or close to the sea, so where offshore wind farm will be connected with uh, with our electricity system. If we turn it on that place, turn it back from from electricity into into hydrogen, we saw that we could reduce the amount of space needed. So from cables, we needed 48 meters in in white from from the mass flux all the way to the other side of the port. And we could reduce that to six meters if we turn it into hydrogen and trans transfer it via a pipeline. Um, also, what we saw is that if, for example, a company wanted to produce green uh, hydrogen within the furnace or within the uh, so very close to the city, um, uh, the green hydrogen, if, if they want to install an electrolyzer, it will take at least 
10 to 15 years in order to develop the infrastructure over there because it's not there yet and we have to upgrade it significantly. Um, so those companies that are now located inside the, um, the conversion park, we make it happen that they can start producing uh, already before 2025. So the first electrolyzer wants to be operational in 2023. If they took another place, another location in, um, in the port of Rotterdam, it will take at least 10 years longer. So uh, I think it's, you know, also the companies see that uh, the companies in the, in the conversion park really sees the added value of the conversion park. So it's one side, it's because we, they can start producing much faster than on their own side. Uh, but on the other side, on the other hand, uh, we in, uh, create the infrastructure that they need. Not only the electricity and not only the hydrogen, but definitely the, for example, the heat extract that they can uh, can have over there. So it's it's an interesting location for them. Uh, the infrastructure is there also for in order to scale up. And um, yeah, they can do they cannot do it on a, on another place in the port. Nice. Then clear added value indeed. Okay, so we learn about the division, the demands that were projected. Um, by the Port of Rotterdam, and interesting to see that Randolph mentioned that this work started actually in 2016. So you see how it was paved the way until now, and of course, next plan. And looking at the globe for other countries and other developments and other flows of green hydrogen, we have Monica Swanson. Monica Swanson is the Area Program Manager for Green Hydrogen or Hydrogen Imports. And she is the one looking at you know, a list of countries and seeing what is the possibility to import that hydrogen in order to come to the Port of Rotterdam. So without further ado, Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Duna, and thank you, Randall, for your really good introduction of what we're doing in Rotterdam. Um, I'm just going to pull the slides up again so I can give you a little more of a walkthrough of our port and our activities. And Randolph, there's a slide there about demand, and if you have anything to say on that, which I might not be complete on, just, you know, uh, throw in a few words from, from your own, because I know you were involved in the early analysis and... Uh, it's always interesting to have an additional uh, viewpoint there. This is where we were just now. And this is the picture that Randolph already explained to us oh, and the electrolyzer park. And now I want to talk a little bit more about uh, the international setting. Uh, all three of us, we, we regularly are in contact with all kinds of uh, projects across the world. Um, it's really our job together to contact and connect with uh, companies, uh, energy uh, providers, governments who have plans to produce green hydrogen and make sure we connect with those projects to see if we can get that hydrogen into Rotterdam. Uh, because the oil and gas market, that's how it currently looks. We are one of the important hubs for it. Prices are partly de determined as well in Rotterdam as well as in Houston or Singapore and that kind of areas. But Rotterdam is a very important hub for the oil and gas trade. And we expect to also be that for the hydrogen trade. And when I say hydrogen, I also mean ammonia. I also mean LOHC, I also mean green methanol, because all of that is related. It's all the green, low carbon or zero emission fuels and feedstocks of the future that we are looking to import. Um, if you look at <coughs> hydrogen, you can see uh, a green dot for uh, Pissing, uh, our sister port. And there's a number of green dots here because one location to produce uh, against demand in Europe won't be enough. There's going to be an expected 60 million tons of hydrogen per annum required in 2050, and 20 million tons of those are going to come into Europe via Rotterdam. And uh, if you look at Rotterdam again, you've seen this picture, but just realize 
that 13% of, um, Randolph already mentioned it, this 13 to 14% of the total EU energy consumption now comes into Rotterdam. Um, sorry about that. And we reach 40% of the high demand industrial areas in the EU. Uh, Duna already asked, how are you doing this? Well, we work together with 3,000 companies in our port. If they don't change the way they work, the port cannot change the way they, it works because we do this with our port community. We don't have our own terminals. It's all commercial companies doing the work. So it's, it's a very intensive process there. Randolph already mentioned a few names of companies putting up electrolyzers. Well, that's all happening right now. Terminals in this area are changing from coal to, for instance, ammonia and making plans for that. And we talk with them because it's very important for us to stay aligned. Now, this is the demand um, expectation analysis that Randolph also was involved in, where we see uh, that, and we did this together with a lot of uh, institutes and companies. So this was really well researched. Um, if you look at this, this yellow sail here, I always call it a sail, but it's actually a, a very simple representation of the demand. It's a graph and you can see a timeline underneath and that timeline starts in 2020, ends in 2050. And you can see at the peak of demand here, 2050, 20 million tons per annum. Now, of course, Randolph already explained we're going to have some production in our port. And uh, when I say some, uh, of course, it is quite respectable, uh, especially if you consider what Randolph just said, that currently 10 to 20 megawatt electrolyzers are the norm, are the normal electrolyzers. And we're moving into a new normal where we're doing adding, where we're going to add up 200 megawatt, 200 megawatt, 200 megawatt to, to get to just one first gigawatt. And we need many more gigawatts across the world. So this is why we are connecting with so many projects, because we understand that, you know, between now and 2030, we will probably still be able to, you know, uh, get on, get along with what we get now, or it will increase, but it won't in increase immensely yet because production has not started in the volumes we needed. But by 2030, we're really counting on the world producing um, and accelerating production and starting to meet the hockey stick of demand that is projected here. Because by then, by, by 2030, we will have some gray, but be reducing it. We will have, we'll be using blue because that's available and we will start to use green. And then the green production goes up and also green demand really demanded by European Union policies. The green is really what we want. Um, is going to come into Europe and going to come into our port. And you can see from this, sorry, from this picture that um, there's a mix at first, 2020, 2030, there will be this sort of area where we can locally produce, but everything on top of this shaded green area, this whole part, so some 18 million tons, you can see it in the column next to it, some 18 million tons is going to be imported by ship over Rotterdam to meet demand, energy demand in our hinterland. Now, how does that look? We're really a tiny country, uh, but this is actually, if you look at the red and orange countries in, on, this, on this picture, these are the, com the countries we already bring coal, oil, gas, uh, all kinds of uh, energy products into uh, uh, LNG, you name it, anything you could, used to have uh, and also, of course, already hydrogen and everything. But in any case, these areas, the bright red areas and the orange areas are exactly the hinterland of our port now, where energy is required in high volumes. So to connect with that hinterland makes sense. Um, you can see here we're, we're this tiny country and we want to connect to the gas grid. As, as Randolph said, we want to connect via a pipeline to North Rhine-Westphalia and to the southern parts of the Netherlands, where there's also uh, a lot of industrial activity. Um, this is the picture you saw earlier. Um, so when you look at the white pipeline in the middle, that will connect into other areas and have another pipeline system as kind of an extension to it. Um, imports, as I said, are very, very important. Some 18 million tons per annum required, we expect at this point in time. And um, 
our timelines are fairly ambitious. As big projects go, there can always be delays or changes, but this is the ambition. This is also the, the ambition we express. And this is what we work on with various companies. So 2023, uh, electrolyzers of 150 to 250 megawatt, where, whereas now electrolyzers of 10 to 20 megawatt are common. So that's huge, and it's going to be happening in 2023 already. The white backbone that was on the previous picture, 2024. Numerous projects starting 2025, also getting the first imports of LOHCs and green ammonia. We are expecting those 2024, 2025. We're going to have 12 inland barges. Uh, barges are expensive. It's not tiny. It's, it's quite a capital investment, but to have 12 on hydrogen is quite something. Uh, we're looking at uh, connecting with truck projects and having our modality road cleaned up, et cetera, et cetera. And by 2030, we hope to have uh, two to two and a half gigawatt of electrolysis operational. Um, I want to stop here because I give, want to give my colleague Wouter the opportunity to talk a little bit more about the Delta Corridor, the pipeline system connecting us into the demand areas in Germany. So I'm going to just quickly hide this again to give Juna the opportunity to introduce Wouter. Thank you, Monica. Um, I think it was very clear when you showed the graph that shows the demand on how much the port of Rotterdam and, and actually Europe would need the import flows. What I would be curious to hear is what, how does the port of Rotterdam scout opportunities for countries that are that have the potential to produce green hydrogen? Um, if you can share with us what countries you're talking to and looking at, um, what are they preparing to do, what are their plans, and how you view you know, the demand or the producing side on your experience. Yeah, maybe I should yeah. then again maybe share my screen. Just to uh, go back to the presentation and to look at the map we have a bit higher up. There's an echo uh, on the sound right now, maybe. Because uh, that's the, the map, uh, the map of the world, as many people now see it. I hope you can all see the, the areas that are red and orange and, and yellow. It's a bit like the uh, energy demand areas, only this is the, these are the areas where conditions for renewable energy, so for green electricity made from sun, wind, water are really extremely good. Actually, the, the, the hydro is not represented here correctly because Brazil has a huge um, capacity for that uh, traditionally and is now adding wind and solar, of course, to that, especially in the province of Sierra. But you can see the red hot areas are the areas where the expected electricity price and the conditions for renewables are so good and so the price being so low that it is possible in these areas, in these regions, to produce hydrogen from green electricity at a market competitive price and where it will be possible to, even if you add cost for shipping it and handling it, it will be possible to expo export that sunshine and that wind to other countries that need it. And you can see all these arrows here uh, going into, uh, of course, Northwestern Europe but also going into uh, other uh, demand countries like Korea and Japan. And there's a lot of opportunities there for countries who have good conditions for renewables um, to, to enter a new market uh, potentially. And, and, and I always say, and that's a literal thing to say, it's, it's, it's like a power shift. It really is a power shift. So there's some, of course, areas like in the Middle East where they hit the jackpot twice. They were lucky with oil and they were lucky now or seem are lucky now with the renewables. There's also countries that are new to the game and are entering a, a new market that will bring their countries um, a lot of opportunities. So um, if you if you say uh, uh, what is your your aim and how do you source uh, the, 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 how do you make the right connections that really to countries that want to e produce for export that where there's projects with commercial pump companies and governments really working hard on that together to make sure it, it happens. You also need export ports. So there also need to be good ports to 
to, to bring the goods, to take the goods out of the country by ship. And we connect with those ports, we connect with those companies, and uh, uh, yeah, it's just a tremendous lot of activity going on right now. Thank you for your question, Donna. And we thank you for taking the time to, to tell us the story. And it's really a combination of factors that have to be uh, aligned in order to, to prepare for this new economy as it, as it emerges. Well, and to tell us a little bit more about how the Port of Rotterdam will connect to the off-takers and potential clients that will use, make use of this green hydrogen, I then have the pleasure of inviting Wouter Deminent. Wouter is commercially responsible for the Delta Corridor for the Port of Rotterdam, and he'll tell us all about that project. Thank you, Wouter. Thank you, Duna and Monica, if I might ask you to put up the slides again. And I will tell you something about the, uh, the Delta Corridor. Uh, as mentioned by, uh, by Randolph and, uh, and Monica, Port of Rotterdam has the ambition to become the hydrogen hub of, of Northwest Europe. And also, as indicated by Monica, maybe you can go back two slides. No, one more. You see the, the picture on the right hand side where, uh, well, the Netherlands is the orange part, and, and right behind the, that on the right hand side, you see the red. Uh, area where the highest demand of, uh, for energy is in, uh, in Northwest Europe. Uh, and then if you now can go to the, uh, the actual Delta Corridor slide, Monica. We are developing as Port of Rotterdam uh, uh, a pipeline corridor towards the, uh, the hinterland of, uh, of the Port of Rotterdam, which is actually the, uh, the, the mentioned orange and red areas on that, uh, that previous slide uh, that you see here. Uh, and that's the uh, uh, the south of the Netherlands and the Duisburg Cologne area uh, in Germany. Uh, in those areas, um, you have the basic heart of the industrial clusters in Northwest Europe, uh, with uh, uh, a lot of chemical uh, clusters, but uh, also refineries, uh, steel uh, companies, cement industry. Uh, all the, the large industrial players are in those areas and have high energy demands. So what we are uh, um, doing as Port of Rotterdam, we've done a study in 2020 investigating the uh, possibility of connecting our port via pipelines uh, to the industrial areas in, uh, in the south of the Netherlands and in, uh, and in Germany. Um, and at that moment in time, we looked at uh, uh, connecting it for LPG and, and propylene chemical products. Um, but as in the same time, the development of hydrogen um, became uh, uh, very strong. So we also added those. And the, uh, the result of that study showed that it is a very uh, feasible case to connect uh, these industrial clusters via pipeline. Uh, as uh, uh, today, these products are transported via barge or rail, and hydrogen isn't even transported yet. Um, so on that initiative, please go back to the, uh, the previous slide. Um, on the result of that uh, uh, study, we have been appointed as the Port of Rotterdam by the government of the Netherlands to uh, initiate this project and, and take it further. Um, so we've started a public-private initiative together with the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate and Ministry of Infrastructure in the Netherlands to develop uh, uh, this project. Um, uh, and right now we are setting up the uh, detailed feasibility study to, uh, uh, to further investigate the feasibility of each of these pipelines. The project itself now consists of a pipeline corridor from Rotterdam to the Moerdijk area, which is a chemical and refinery cluster, to Gemmelot in the south of the Netherlands, and then uh, into Germany to the uh, duisburg gelsenkirchen area and into Cologne, uh, where, as mentioned, there are a lot of uh, industrial uh, clusters to be found. Uh, and this pipeline corridor uh, will consist of pipelines for uh, um, 
LPG and propylene, uh, but also CO2 towards the port of Rotterdam. Uh, as mentioned by, uh, by Randolph, we have a project in our port already uh, looking into capturing CO2 and storing it in uh, depleted gas fields under the North Sea. And we intend to also uh, do that for uh, the industrial clusters in our hinterland. So the uh, CO2 can be captured and then transported via the Delta Corridor to Rotterdam, where it is put into a pipeline, offshore pipeline towards empty gas fields to uh, um, get, uh, store the CO2. Um, and then, the, as we know, uh, CO2 capturing, uh, as we look at it, is a, a transitional uh, phase. Uh, it is a necessary step to realize CO2 reductions uh, in the short term. So we also envision to transfer this pipeline into a hydrogen pipeline the other way around. So from Rotterdam to our hinterland uh, in 15 or 20 years time when uh, CO2 is, uh, is not available anymore because it is uh, phased out. And uh, hydrogen is uh, increasing in demand as, as seen in the graph of, uh, of Monica. Um, and the fourth pipeline will be this hydrogen pipeline uh, for which we intend to develop uh, um, uh, and have this pipeline operational in 2025 in the Netherlands and then into Germany as well in 2026-27. This requires a lot of um, spatial planning and permitting and, and also, of course, feasibility study done on technical and, and commercial and economical grounds. Um, but uh, especially on the spatial planning part, in the Netherlands there is a uh, vision for pipelines which enables us to develop pipelines uh, in a reserved corridor. Uh, and in this reserve corridor right now already the existing oil and oil product pipelines uh, which exist since the uh, early 60s of uh, uh, the last uh, decennium, it is I believe, um, the, the uh, uh, oil pipelines are already there so we are not developing something new, uh, it actually exists already for 60-70 years uh, and we're just replacing the fossil-based pipelines uh, in 20, 30 years' time by uh, renewable-based pipelines. Um, then, uh, possibly in, in the next slide, Monica. And uh, Ed, the pipelines uh, are already there, but also the, uh, uh, the uh, um, Port of Rotterdam um, uh, is, uh, uh, has been the largest port in the world and also uh, the largest port in Europe because of its good hinterland connection. So also there you see uh, on this picture the uh, infrastructure uh, for road uh, as well as barge and rail that already is in place and also uh, enables us to transport hydrogen to, uh, to our hinterland, for instance by truck, by rail uh, and by barge. Um, as mentioned, uh, uh, the, the planning is to connect these, uh, these pipelines or, or realize these pipelines uh, before 25, 26 to be operational around that time and be ready for the large import demands that we expect uh, and, and uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the large import uh, supplies that we expect to serve the uh, demand from our hinterland in the, in the Netherlands and, uh, and Germany. Um, and to be ready for this new development. Thank you. Great plans. Thank you, Walter. To conclude, we are ready. I see the, the slide of, uh, of, of all of you. Thank you, Walter. It's uh, quite impressive. And I have to say also quite ambitious, right? 25, 26. Um, a question that burns me right now is what are those potential clients saying about the Delta Corridor project? Are they uh, enthusiastic about it? Are they waiting for somebody else to develop it? Um, are they jumping on to be part of that development? What, what is your 
your experience in dealing with them with regards to this uh, those a courier? Um, yes, thank you for the question. I think uh, um, everybody is enthusiastic about it, and also everybody acknowledges that basically we are already too late. If you look at the uh, climate ambitions and targets uh, that are set uh, and that are uh, being uh, uh, set or increased, basically, yeah, the, the demand or the target for 2030 was 45% reduction in CO2. It's already been increased to 55% reduction in CO2, and Germany is even talking about 65% reduction in CO2 by 2030. Um, which means that infrastructure should be in place to realize those ambitions. And Delta Corridor is exactly that. It's the infrastructure that enables the private uh, companies to realize the climate ambitions that they have. Um, so it's ambitious. Uh, uh, it's uh, what we said is still possible, but it is uh, dependent on a lot of elements uh, to come into place. Uh, but we are working very hard to, to making that happen because we have the, these climate ambition targets. Indeed, yeah. Good to see that there is enthusiasm. And of course the question, who's going to pay for it? Um, and that applies for the backbone infrastructure that Randolph uh, first showed, but also for the longer, uh, much wider project on the Delta border. Who finances it all? Is, do we know that? Um, not completely. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the backbone infrastructure, the white pipeline that was shown by, uh, by Randolph, is a project of Port of Rotterdam and Gasuni, uh, the Dutch TSO in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, they are responsible for the development of the project and investment in the project. Of course, they are also looking into uh, 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 the, uh, support from the government to realize this, this project. Because the uh, important uh, aspect of this project is you're not developing it for the coming five years, you're developing this infrastructure for the coming 35 years or 50 years. So you're oversizing basically the infrastructure that is needed today to be ready for the future. And there you need uh, support from the government to make that happen. Um, so, uh, on the one hand, uh, we have uh, Gas Unie and Port of Rotterdam investing, but also looking at, uh, uh, at support from the government to make this happen. And the Delta Corridor project is an uh, initiative from uh, the Port of Rotterdam. It is outside our uh, port, not a port development in that sense, but it's of such huge importance to us because today 50% of our cargo throughput is based on fossil uh, uh, feedstock, uh, uh, coal, oil, gas, that in the next 30, 35 years will phase out. So if this infrastructure uh, doesn't get into play, then uh, for us, 50% of our cargo throughput is at risk. So we have a huge uh, interest in developing this project. That's what we will do. And we will also have, we will look into the investment, but it's, it's, it's in that sense too big for us. So we also need support from the government as well as from the private uh, side of, uh, of companies to develop this project. But uh, there are uh, a huge industrial clusters that, that need this infrastructure and are also uh, prepared and willing to, uh, to look at that. Nice, nice to see that there's support from actually several sectors and that's what I believe we see with related to hydrogen, um, all parties need to be involved, private, government, boards, etc., and citizens. Um, okay, thank you all. I have some uh, some questions here that I'm just gonna put it out there and feel free to, to, to jump. Let's see um, who, how we can have this, this debate. So CO2 uh, was discussed, of course. There is the carbon capture storage that Randolph presented um, in the North Sea, and also the pipeline that Walter mentioned. But I was wondering, is there something that could be done uh, with that CO2? Could we put it to use, um, for example, methanol or other products or 
How do you view those developments? Can I answer that one? Yeah. Um, so today, what we what we have, so the CO two is already used in the, in the boiler of them. So the existing OCOP CO two pipeline, which connects Shell and and Alco to the greenhouses, um, they capture today half a million tons of, of hydrogen each year, and we bring that to the to, to the greenhouses to the CO two. Um, so the uh, so the CO2 is used in the greenhouses. We expect that that can grow to in this area to 1.3 megatons per year, and we see in the short term we see that that is um, well the biggest market for CO2. Um, so it, and, and and if you look to the port of Rotterdam, if you look to the industrial area of the port of Rotterdam, it's it's today emitting uh, roughly 30 megatons of uh, of CO2. So we can capture and we can reuse on, on very very fast one megaton, but then still we have 29 megatons of CO2 uh, that we need to capture uh, and store because otherwise, what, what can we do with it? Uh, so we expect that in the future we can also find other uh, uses for the CO2, uh, but but we are capturing what we are start capturing uh, with the Portus pipeline is so much. And we start with two megatons, and then it scales up even further to, I think, a maximum of ten megatons. Um, there is not so many applications today, so therefore, uh, in the beginning, it will definitely be stored under the North Sea in the, in the depleted gas fields. Uh, but in the future, yes, we can we can start reusing it. Um, so this is one of the directions that, with the CO2 infrastructure, where they look at, and the other way where they are also looking at is if you use bio feedstock. In your uh, processes, and you capture the CO2, you can even go to negative emissions. But this is also a direction where uh, the port of Rotterdam is looking at. Negative emissions. Well, wow, that's uh, <laughs> that. That is a new one for me. <laughs> I always learn. Good. Um, and we talked about potential uses and potential users in uh, in the industrial terrain um, at the port of Rotterdam, but also um, in Germany. Uh, steel mill plants, uh, cement plants, and I'm thinking, what about shipping? Shipping is also uh, water transport, right? It's also a big contributor to, to, to emissions, and there is a big statement from the shipping community to be able to decarbonize as well and to make their contributions. Um, the Port of Rotterdam is a port, as Monica has shown, that is in the oil flows of the world, and therefore it also is a big conquering port. Um, is is the Port of Rotterdam, are any of you looking or know of any kind of bunkering developments? Will ammonia be the new bunker fuel? Will methanol? Um, I know that there is already some developments in LNG at the port, so could could. Um, you comment on the bunkering plans uh, with regards to related to hydrogen. Maybe if it's okay, I'll start responding and ask my colleagues to compliment me where I have emissions there. But of course, Port of Rotterdam is a very, very large bunkering port. So anyone who bunkers their ships in Rotterdam will in future need to do so with different fuels and feedstocks. That's one thing we're looking at, and that's something we need to also transition. Uh, you may have read uh, about Maersk, who have commissioned a number of ships for methanol. Uh, also a very relevant development. Uh, direct ammonia bunkering, direct methanol bunkering. It's all happening. There's, it's all being piloted already in our port as well. Uh, that's what I would like to say about it. Maybe my colleagues have more to add, but that's the big picture for me is that, you know, we're working on that aspect as well. Also for the barges, but maybe uh, my colleagues want to compliment me here and say some more. I think I've been complete. Um, I think I've been complete. <laughs> you are definitely complete. Um, the only thing that I would like to add to that is uh, within the Rhine project. So, what, what Monica also showed in the um, in the timeline, 
uh, in 2025, they're aiming for 12 uh, barges on, on hydrogen. Um, and what they're also looking at, especially where we are looking at in, in, in that project for, is the bunkering facilities that, that needs to be in place for that as well. So, uh, and, and not only in the Board of Rotterdam, of course, also further on in the system towards, for example, Duisburg, we also need the bunkering uh, facilities over there in order to make the chain and in order to make those companies be able to switch from uh, the fossil fuel to, to hydrogen. Um, so yeah, there is a lot going on in, in, in bunkering um, and uh, it's, it's, it's also connected to the project that we, well, that, that we showed you today and that we are doing in this, in this area. So by that I get that the Port of Rotterdam is open to all types of developments. It's not choosing a specific fuel, but it's rather open to whatever the developments might bring, such as the one that Monica mentioned about Varsk uh, betting on, on methanol, right? Okay, all right. Um, and, and maybe looking internationally, and, and uh, maybe Monica, this goes to you, but feel free. Um, what, you know, in saying we are very busy with developing a green um, hydrogen hub in order to produce locally, uh, use it locally, distribute it, but also to export. And for that, the, the state government, the act itself, the university, Federal University of Sierra, um, and the board, of course, has been working hard and together with a lot of assistance from the Port of Rotterdam. And I wonder, in your experience looking at developments internationally in different countries, what are the critical success factors that you believe should be in place? And um, also from your perspective, Ad, Adolf and, and Walter, in terms of stakeholders being aligned, in terms of infrastructure being readily available, financing, you know, all of it. What do you think are really important variables to have in place? In order to really make this um, make this happen, make a green hydrogen hub uh, a reality. Yeah. Um, if I may go uh, go first, Monica. Yeah. I, I, I see you have burning uh, uh, lips to to answer, but um, no, I think uh, that two uh, things uh, come to mind. Uh, one is partnerships. Um, uh, that's what you definitely need in this, uh, this development because we are talking about a transition, uh, 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 maybe even the biggest transition well, in, in centuries uh, that we have to go through and you cannot do that uh, by yourself. So you, we definitely need partnerships. And if you look at uh, the same complex uh, and compare it, for instance, to Rotterdam, uh, as well, uh, we as Port of Rotterdam try to be the enabler of, of this uh, uh, transition and this development. So we are very much focused on creating this partnership and, and developing the enabling infrastructure so that companies can uh, develop their uh, businesses uh, as good as they do. Uh, and I think that is something um, that, that you could also develop in uh, in Peseng, uh, as the uh, the enabling infrastructure and, and be the connecting neutral party between all these uh, businesses, connecting them together to uh, develop this uh, this infrastructure, um, because it's it's a very much chicken and egg problem, and somebody has to take the first step, and I think infrastructure is uh, is one of the important elements in there, um, and there Peseng can play a really big role, together with the state, of course. Yeah. Monica Randolph? Maybe Monica first. And I think I, uh, I fully agree, and I have to, of course, uh, underpin what Wouter says. It's very important to have connectors, as it were, uh, a, a central function there. And I think also think, um, um, especially because PSM has the opportunity to be an exporting country uh, or an exporting location, 
Uh, what we have in the Netherlands is we have we have the demand, but we don't have the space to produce. And I think it's very interesting uh, for, well, for being an export country that you have enough space in order to develop this uh, this economy, this green production facilities. Um, and also, and then of course you have different countries all over the globe that can maybe do that. And then it's of course very interesting to see, okay, what will be the price produced in Beisem compared to another uh, country in, in the world. And I think with an high, um, with, with a huge amount of, of wind hours over there, um, great potential in solar, I think you definitely have a good opportunity to be one of the cheapest countries to produce green hydrogen. And then that's, of course, from a business perspective, a very interesting one. Excellent. So connectivity yeah, so in terms of partners, partnerships can never do this, this big initiative alone. Um, enabling infrastructure. And I think here, we're almost looking at enabling the infrastructure ahead of the of the demand, so to, so to speak, so the, to, to solve the chicken and egg situation. Yeah. And of course, uh, being remaining uh, competitive at the end, there is a price that has to be paid and it has to be competitive compared to, to other players. And as Monica showed us in the map, in the world map, the best locations are the ones that have most uh, or most competitive renewable uh, energy sources, and I think that that's that's you know the main of the, the bulk of the of the price for green hydrogen production. So um, what I take from all of this is that by saying is uh, is well positioned uh, and the state of Seattle is well positioned. So uh, the idea here is to create this corridor linking by saying to Rotterdam with green energy flows um, and, and and use all of that infrastructure that was shown here today. So um, well I I thank you very much for for the sharing um, of, of your knowledge of the developments and in this debate. I want to give an opportunity for each one of you to make an end note uh, remark that you would like to to finish this with. Uh, let's see, Randolph, why don't you start? Um, well, I would like to thank you very much for this, uh, this great panel uh, and of the opportunity that we had to, uh, to present the Port of Rotterdam here today. Um, I think PSAM is a very interesting location, a good location, and I'm really looking forward to the value chain that we can create between the PSAM and, uh, and the Port of Rotterdam. Okay, Monica? Well, we're both nodding uh, at Randall's words already because we are, you know, of course, working with your uh, port, uh, working with the state, uh, exchanging ideas, and we find a very professional cooperation on the other side. And it's, uh, if you look at competitiveness, to be professional in this is also very important. And uh, you need space, you need surplus electricity, but that's not the only element. You also need to just do it. And uh, chicken and egg things, hesitation on production side is no use considering the huge market out there. So my, my last you know, tag here would be that uh, you should go for it, start producing, and there will be a market waiting for it. So. The slogan of the city of Rotterdam, right? To make it happen. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I fully agree with, uh, with my colleagues, of course, and uh, uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, I've been many times to, uh, to Pesen, and I always enjoyed the sun there. And now we have the opportunity to really get the sun to Rotterdam as well. So let's, let's make that happen. <laughs> yeah, because when do you have enough? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it was a pleasure uh, to be here today. And of course, we welcome uh, questions and remarks from the public. So we'll be available to, to gather those at the end of this panel. And thank you so much, um, Randolph, Wouter, and Monica for taking the time. I know how busy you are, how many uh, uh, developments are taking place here. Well, to them, 
but I think it's extremely important to connect um, in order to be able to really have that value add to, to our final clients. So thank you, FIEC, for the, for the invitation. And on behalf of uh, the St. Paul Complex, uh, we would like to finalize this. Thank you very much.